Hi, I'm Lisa Wimberger, and welcome to my show, Unlock Hope. As an entrepreneur and founder of the Neurosculpting Institute, I have worked with thousands of clients in helping them work through emotional and physical challenges. Your brain is more powerful than you would ever believe, and I can teach you to work through issues like anxiety, depression, and even physical challenges, and for once, unlock hope in your future. I've worked with some incredible humans like pro athletes and wellness leaders, and I'll be bringing you tools and tips to help you overcome those big issues in your life, as well as introducing you to some very successful people in other complementary areas of wellness. So please join me each week as we help you and others find the joy in your life. Welcome to Unlock Hope. I am stoked. That's an understatement. I'm going to use that word very loosely today um, to give you a little background on Stephen Kotler. So for those of you who don't know, and if you don't know, you're probably living under a rock. So I will just say that he is a 10 times New York Times bestselling author, author of 14 books, award-winning journalist, executive director of the Flow Research Collective, um, nominated for a Pulitzer Prize holy crap, um, appeared in publications like the Harvard Business Review, New York Times, Atlantic Monthly, Wall Street Journal, Animal Rights Advocate, and I dare say probably the biggest, underst biggest understatement, that's an oxymoron, the understatement of the century, an avid skier. Okay, I'm going to start there. So, um, Stephen, first of all, any conversation I've ever had with you has completely got my brain going 5,000 miles an hour um, into all these different directions. I think you're sort of masterful at getting people's brains to do that. I'm experiencing that right now as I'm reading NAR Country, which is your upcoming book that I wanna talk about. Um, but I'm a little confused because I'm resonating so much with this book and I'm not a skier and the book takes the context of skiing. So how did you do that? How did you make <laughs> it accessible to me? I don't even ski. Yeah, it was um, when I set out to write the book, the, the, the opportunity slash challenge, one of them was uh, I really wanted to write a book about applied peak performance and in the context of our country, applied peak performance aging. Right. And to do that, like nobody's really done it. Jim Fix sort of did it in, in the book of running 30 or 40 years ago. You have to you have to focus on a subject that you know a great deal about and, you know, into like a level of overkill. I so some of it is like I mean, it's weird stuff. Lisa. There's a, there's like real answers to your question. So there are sections in the skiing. There are peak performance sections, there are peak performance aging sections, there are adventure sections, uh, there are humor sections. And a lot of it was about what the hell is the balance? Like, what do you, what is the reader need? So I had to, to write this book, I had 22, 23 outside readers, which is like oh. four times what I would normally do or five times what I would normally do. But it was so important that like the reader had your experience, which is I don't give a fuck about this sport, but wow, I'm having a lot of fun. Well, it was masterful because I because as someone also who studies the brain, I could see the meta data weaving through it. I could see that you were actually teaching the embodied principles through the storytelling which it's really, it's really hard, I think. Uh, I haven't had this experience a lot where I'm reading a book and I feel like it's not just telling me something, it's actually moving me through an experience. Great authors do that for me. And, you know, I was excited to get the book because I love your work, but part of me was like, oh, I'm not a skier. How am I gonna connect to this? And you just, you did it masterfully. And you kept using this phrase, embodied cognition. And you were using it to express the way your body remembers and you were using it in, in your ski references. But I was having embodied cognition reading the book because I was feeling learning. And I'm 
super excited as someone in their 50s as well to apply this um, sense of unstoppable progress to an aging body and an aging brain. So I would love for you to talk about the how and the why of finding your peak performance. And you just said before I hit record, you said you feel like stronger than you've ever felt in your life. How does the regular person get there? Well, so I think that was one of the things that I sort of liked about the book and the, and the reason I did it the way I did it. When it comes to athletic anything, I am way more disadvantaged than the regular person. Say I've more. Had, what, what does that mean? It, well, I've broken 87 bones oh my along God. the way. So I've shattered almost everything and had to rebuild it. I've had four major chronic conditions, multi-year, you know, issues along the way. I have an extremely busy schedule, right? I, I, because of my work at the Flow Research Collective, which is a full-time job, and my work as an author, which is a full-time job, and my work running an animal sanctuary with my wife, which is sort of a full-time job, right? I'm really crazy busy, as busy as, any, as anybody else. Um, and again, I'm, you know, in my fifties. So, um, and the, you know, what all that added up to was perfect for what I was trying to do, right? The old ideas around aging, what like I, I'm affectionately would, would term the long, slow rot theory of aging, which is still the dominant theory of aging for most people, which is like, you know, mental skills and physical skills decline over time. And there's nothing we can do to stop the slide. And one of the big parts of that is you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? Everybody knows that. And so, you know, I set out to, to learn a very difficult, dynamic physical skill in my 50s because, it is, as you pointed out, there's all this new research in my field, flow science, but also in related fields of embodied cognition, which I could talk more about, um, and sort of what you can loosely call network neuroscience or neurodynamics, right? Um, sort of the way brain networks communicate uh, that all really strongly suggested that, you know, all these old ideas were out of date. You could uh, really teach an old dog new tricks. There's, there's, um, there, and I should, if, you know, these theories work outside the lab, you know, I was either going to put myself in the hospital, the theories <laughs> failed, or they were going to work. And I, you know, how does they, your wife deal with all of this? Like, because well, you really push yourself to, to extreme limits. So it, it's an up and down. I get no sympathy at home. <laughs> okay. Like, so when we got married, uh, we, uh, we, we, had, we signed a, we, we signed a ketubah, which is a, a Jewish marriage contract. And to do that, you have to grounds for divorce get listed. So my, she, I can divorce her if she ever tries to stop me from doing action sports and she can divorce me if I'm ever mean to the dogs. Brilliant. So, so How like, come we was, all don't have this? We should um, all have this. Uh, yeah, I think, by the way, preconditions for divorce are actually healthy for a relationship, <laughs> I think. But the other, uh, the, uh, I get no sympathy, though, because I've broken so many things over so many years that, like, she doesn't, right? So, like, when I really mangle myself, she doesn't care. When I say things like, honey, this time it really hurts. I mean, like, that's what you say every time. Like, you're always hurt. <laughs> oh. Oh my God. So I, I want to go back to something where, so yeah, we're, we're learning all about like the way neurons network and we can push ourselves past the point we ever thought possible, but can you do that with no base skills already existing yeah, so, in that body of skills you want to learn? So, I don't know about no base skills. Let me back this up a little bit. The experiment, I attempted was I wanted to teach myself how to park ski in, uh, I wanted to see how far I could go and how long it would take. And um, park skiing is the discipline in skiing that involved jumps and rails and wall rides and boxes and very acrobatic. It's obviously very dangerous. And they're about, depending on how you count them, but 10 different biological reasons why it's supposed to be impossible for anybody really over the age of 35 um, or 35, it's very difficult. 45, it's kind of crazy. And by 50, you're, you know, downright impossible. Mm. Um, this is what I want to against. And to measure progress, we, I created a list of tricks I wanted to learn. It was 20 tricks I wanted to learn a single season if I could. And the tricks would get me from zero, no experience as a park skier, which is where I started. I was a, a good skier, but I had zero experience in the terrain park whatsoever. And didn't really know any tricks. 
um, to intermediate in, in, I didn't know how long it was going to take. I ended up doing it in a single season. Oh my God. It was so much farther than anybody thought possible. You know, it was absurd. What caught my attention during this season was, and uh, my ski partner, Ryan Wicks, uh, who was a former sponsored pro athlete, like a park skier, who got really injured and hadn't really skied since, park skied since, and he decided to come back to it. And he was using all these same ideas. And he's mm. 20 years younger than me. And his progress was like leaps and bounds. So that, all that caught our attention. That's the core of the book. That's what you've read. Yeah, yeah. But question about- Hold on, hold on. Okay, me, go, go, me, go ahead. Let me answer your question. Last season, because two people are just a pilot study, right? Like it was tantalized and got some data, but it was a pilot study. So last season we teamed up um, with Palisades Tahoe and uh, North Star California. We took 17 older adults, ages 30 to 68. Um, none had park skiing experience before. Uh, in fact, a bunch of them were actually just intermediate skiers. They weren't even like good skiers or expert skiers, they were just intermediate skiers. We used the exact same learning protocol we used, Ryan and I used. We spent four days with them on the hill. Um, so they got, and we, uh, lots of uh, preliminary data gathering, data gathering on the back end. We gave them flow short scales throughout the day. And then we filmed everything and then assessed their progress using the standard FIS, which is the governing body in freestyle skiing and snowboarding, their criteria for progress. Um, and so we did that. Uh, and when the book comes out, we have a, a big video and a big white paper, but people got remarkably far. And then because not everybody's going to be a skier or a snowboarder, right? We were like, okay, we took all that translated out of skiing and snowboarding, built it into a class mm. and um, have now run it with over 200 people. And we've got people with zero experience in their fifties who are designing NAR style quests. We've got one person who's taught themselves how to kite surf, one person who's horseback riding adventures, on and on and on. I mean, some of them are doing cognitive quests and like they're not doing physical stuff because you don't have to, but it's kind of amazing. I, yeah. I'm so ex like lit up about it. First of all, I love the, I love the phrase NAR quest. That's just cool. The other thing um, is that you have to also understand just because it's nowhere in any of the shit that's going to come out on the other end. I didn't think it was going to work. Like I literally showed up the first day of the experiment. I looked at Ryan. I looked at like, the people who were helping me run it. I was like, this is going to be a disaster. And as long as we can keep people out of the hospital, like that's good fun. Like, there's no way this is going to work. It's a dumb idea. We're going to do it anyways. But like, we just got to add by the end of day one, it wasn't like we got to keep people out of the hospital. They're so bad. It was, they made so much progress in one day that they were so exuberant. We had to keep them calm wow. from like going to the hospital in the other direction. It was, we couldn't believe, like nobody was more shocked than me like because i you it's such the principles were so weird and park skiing is so hard and so dangerous and so scary um and we found a way to do it safely and make it available to everybody well yeah. i i love that because my my translation of that is because you didn't make the assumption that it would work that possibly you stayed open to the curiosity of not knowing and just sort of let it unfold. Um, but one of the things I want to know from you, I want to go back to, you said you had no idea how fast this would happen. So you didn't know to set your goal that I would get too advanced by the end of first season, right? You just sort of didn't know how long it would happen. What do you think the role of goal setting played in your um, Okay, achievement so, level because what if you set too aggressive a goal and didn't meet it would you have perceived failure like wh where does goal setting play into this for you so um played a huge role and um so let me back up and actually tell you where this quest came from in the first place this is a story that's not actually in the book okay. um, but uh and because it all started with a very specific goal. So the last conversation I had with Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the godfather of flow psychology, um, who passed away uh, a couple years ago mm -hmm. uh, and uh, was pre-COVID. And 
I had called him up and I, and I, and I was, I had called him up because I, he, they translated a bunch of his stuff out of Italian, a bunch of old interviews and a bunch of stuff it was finally in English. And I saw it for the first time. He was always sort of an avid outdoorsman that known to like, you know, did research on rock climbers and mountaineers and like lived in Montana, liked to hike, all that stuff. But I'm reading all these early materials and I'm like, this guy was a serious climber. Like he's talking about serious Yosemite Valley, 1960s climb. Like I'm, I know the people he's talking about. I'm like, wow, okay. So I called him up and I was like, Mike, you got to tell me something. I know the story you tell the people. He's, by the way, he was 80 some years old at this point and then had a stroke. Oh man. And oh, so his talks was talking very slowly. And I, and I called him up and I was sort of like giving him a little shit. I was like, Mike, I know you tell this story in your TED talk about how you saw flow in a concentration camp and your early research was on artists. But I'm reading all your stuff and I'm like, I think you had my experience. I think you got into flow as an action sport athlete and you needed to explain it. And action sports was so weird, especially back when you start. I mean, it was weird for me doing this work in the 90s and the thousands. He was doing it in the 60s and 70s, mm. right? You would no chance to talk. And I, and I was like, so that's what this is really about, right? You were just a serious mountaineer, flow junkie and blah, blah, blah. And there's this long pause. I lay all this out and there's this you like a minute goes by two minutes and i'm like oh shit i've just pissed off like <laughs> you know the godfather of flow psychology and, you know whoa, whoa and uh after a very long pause he says well steven you got to be careful and i'm like like what do, like i don't know now i'm wondering has he did the stroke affect his brain has he lost the bread and i was like mike what do you, what do i have to be careful about he's like well you get to my age and you do something for flow your whole life. And then you get to my age and forget about climbing mountains. You can't even get out of bed. Wow. You got to have a backup plan. You got to be careful. And it was literally the last conversation I had with him. And I had been studying sort of peak performance aging and regenerative medicine, all these things for a very long time. But suddenly like this was like one flow junkie to another saying, have a backup plan and skiing was always what I did for flow. It was my primary flow experience. And the thing about park skiing was this. I had this idea. So you can use risk as a flow trigger, but it gets really, really, really dangerous as you get older, right? Mm -hmm. You can use novelty as a flow, other things as a flow trigger, but creativity works the best. And so I knew if I could creatively interpret the terrain features on the mountain, which is essentially what park skiing is, Right. If I sort of made my way from zero to intermediate in park skiing, I might have a million more entrances in the flow in my favorite activity in the world. They were a lot safer. And even though it was going to be dangerous to get there, once I got there, I was suddenly the menu was much wider. And while there's more to the back of plan that I ended up developing, that was at the core of it. So when I set the list of goals, yeah, I was really conscious of what you were saying, that if I put a time limit and said, we're going to do this in a season or whatever, I could screw myself because there was, I didn't think there was any way I was going to get there, right? So what I said to myself is, if it takes five years, that's fine. I'll be 60 years old and I'll have a million more entrances to flow in, you know, in my you know, later years and that'll be cool and that'll be totally worth it. And that was where I started. Uh, and uh, so... And I set very specific goals along the way that were not related to outcome. So my, that was the big outcome goal. And then I set like daily process goals. I wanted to show up and ski 12 laps if I was tired, 16 laps if I was felt normal and 20 laps if I felt great and things like that. So I was very specific with how I did it so that the goals, um, for the most part, like all pointed in the same direction and weren't conflicting and didn't screw me up that way because too much stress would have ended up creating more epinephrine blocking flow. Right. But I love that because I'm experiencing that myself now coming into I'm setting decade goals now because it allows for, I think, that balance of risk goals, creativity goals. You said something in your book. I wrote it down. Um, punk feeds anger, feeds creativity, feeds salvation. And I'm experiencing myself that with a longer time frame, and then goals, I love that goals not connected to outcomes, but connected to process. Then that statement you keep saying in the book is, 
one inch at a time might actually get me there becomes real like I, so my decade goals are i i want to be doing like you know 20 reps of pull-ups clean in every arm formation i want to do handstands in every formation i've had zero experience with both and i'm on year one end of year one and i'm at you know four pull-ups clean narrow grip going to move to wide grip like i see that the process feeds the creativity and the creativity feeds the process. And I'm actually getting past where I thought I would be in a year. And so I love that you're distinguishing risk goals from creativity as the fuel, which to me, I, I always convert it into my, like, my lexicon, which is, you know, oh, that's just prefrontal engagement and meeting things with curiosity and creativity versus the, the, maybe the adrenaline of the risk, which, you know, you're saying shuts down flow. So, okay, so you're writing the book for everybody, right? Like every human, because I feel like every human can relate to yeah, this book. I mean, I, I really, it, it, so you have to understand that when I, when I started, I was like, God, is this like just an obnoxious little ski diet? You know what I mean? Like I didn't yeah. think any, and, but more and more, I started to realize that I, yeah, I, now I think it's for everybody. I do. I have to agree. I, I, or I've tried to do it. And the proof to me, by the way, is that my parents who are in their eighties, who are not skiers, who um, don't love everything I write at all. But right. Like, um, and uh, I was like, I didn't even want my father to read the book. I was like, he was like, let me send it to me. And I was like, no dad, I want mom's opinion, but you're going to hate it. Even they liked it. I was once like when my father called me. He was like, "I had a blast. I loved it. I yeah. thought it was really fun." I was like, "You what? Really?" Well, I I almost feel like I could actually learn how to ski now, um, because you've articulated it in in such pragmatic chunks, without it feeling like you're trying to teach me something. Um, you extrapolated your process, but you extrapolated in a way that I am understanding it. Um, which, well, you know, I would never, ha I would never have picked up a book on skiing and thought I would get that much out of it. What was interesting. One of the reasons I sort of knew that was going to work is, um, at the same time I was running this particular experiment, uh, my best friend was running the exact same experiment, but teaching myself how to play guitar mm. and in his late fifties. And, um, so he, we were having side-by-side -side experiences and it was music was translating immediately into ski and vice versa and i was like oh wow so even in the beginning because i was what michael the, my best friend is also my editor so he was reading all my stuff once or twice a week and saying you know uh, in guitar blah blah and i'm like yeah see it's mm. so i had this um, i had immediate feedback great flow trigger by the way um but uh a really good like comparison with somebody learning a, a skill that had you know what I mean that was out so we could get it like universal principles so it wasn't just skiing kind of thing and so okay so you talk also about this equation of like challenge skills balance mm -hmm. and I'm guessing that applies whether you're learning guitar or skiing or a cognitive skill acquisition like can Everything. you can you yeah, talk, that, what what is that balance? okay so Flow states are states of optimal performance. We feel our best, we perform our best. Flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow, right? Preconditions that, that, and all the flows, there's like 25 known flow triggers. All of them work the same way. Flow follows focus, right? It only shows up when all our attention is right here, right now. That's what the triggers do. They drive our attention into the present moment. The most famous of all these triggers, what's often called the golden rule into flow, is the challenge skills balance. And the idea is we pay the most attention to the challenge of the task at hand when the challenge slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to stretch but not snap, right? Emotionally, it sits, there's something called the flow channel that sits not exactly on, but very near the midpoint between boredom, not enough stimulation here, I'm not paying any attention, and anxiety, whoa, way too much, right? Mm -hmm. In between is the sweet spot for attention. If you speak physiology, it's the Herb Stopson curve. In psychology, it's the flow channel. And uh, here's what's interesting. So you mentioned earlier one inch at a time. So 
uh, Mihajic sent me high in a Google mathematician, sat down a bunch of years ago, 10, 15 years ago, and tried to calculate, do we know the difference between challenge and skills? Can you put a number on it? And this was a back of the envelope. They took a guess, really, and it was 4% difference between challenge and skills. So hmm. and we took that 4% number um, and ran a bunch of tests on it. It's very hard to test. It's very, very, very hard to test. And I don't think we learned anything definitive, except, yeah, it seems to be deadly accurate. Um, and one of the first things we learned is this is very common in seasonal sports. Beginning of the season starts and first two or three of these could be tennis games or by times of the ski hill or trip surfing or whatever. Uh, you're just getting used to it again, but by like four five or six tend to be really, really flowy. Right. And then you sort of plateau for a very long time. And then, you know, as your skills build up again, going along that challenge skills sweet spot, and then you get more flow at the end of the season. But we found that if people only showed up and tried to take on like these 4% chunks, they didn't plateau. They just kept progressing. So initially we were looking at, it, we were like, Holy crap. This is a really cool accelerated learning tool. Flow amplifies learning anyways, but like this was, you were plateauing. So, wow, this was neat. And then when I was doing the research for our country, and this goes back to something you said, this was the, one of the most crucial insights in going forward with our country was the realization that in older adults and older adults, I mean, like pretty much anybody over 35 at this mm -hmm. point, if you, especially if, if you're trying to learn a physical skill, but it can, this can apply anywhere. We have unconscious fears that we've learned along the way, right? And it, they shrink the challenge skill sweet spot. So instead of assuming that I had a 4% wide challenge skill sweet spot in skiing, even though I've been skiing since I was eight, um, I went, I think it's about one inch wide, mm. like literally like 1% wide. I think it's tiny. So my first order of business was, the first thing we do, we did was we start with fountain, basic motor skills, something you can do 100% of the time with zero fear, no conscious interference, no danger, nothing, and then build one motion, tiny little motion onto it at a time and ex practice that, execute it so you can ex do it with zero fear. And that's how we went. And it was for most athletes, it, you're, it's so much slower mm -hmm. than they're used to going. And this was another realization that what happens to a lot of older athletes is they remember what it was like to make progress in their teens and their twenties. Mm. They expect that rate of progress. So they, right. And that would be fine. Except, and you, and you might be physically able to progress that level, but there's psychological fears that are shrinking this down. And, you know, I'm sure you know this from your work. One of the if you've ever had a long injury, break with a bone or whatever, I will bounce back from a broken bone three to six months in terms of like physically, it will do what I want. But to get myself willing to ski at speed again at maximum velocity after an accident can take almost a year and a half. And it's an unconscious governor. I will be a year in and I'll be like, oh, I'm skiing at top speed. I'm totally back. And then like two months later, I'll be like, oh, wow, I'm going so much faster, I guess. This is top speed. I wasn't. And then, you know, a year, it's about 18 months mm -hmm. consistently for me. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is actually top speed. And it, th so there's this unconscious governor on speed. And I was, you know, every athlete I've talked to, action sport athlete talks about the same thing. And I just went, you know what? If it's after an accident on speed for this long, there's going to be some smaller version of this that's just percolating through our consciousness. So dial it way back, go at it as if this challenge skill sweet spot was really, really, really shrunk. Um, and it, that was one of the sort of core first unlocking moves. Well, I love that because it really takes the uh, principles of neuroplasticity in skills acquisition into consideration, which is small manageable changes that get automated effortlessly over time are the sustainable ones, which then widens that foundation of skills acquisition. So then you can layer more and more and more versus what I think we're all, we all, um, we all sort of orient towards, which is the big monumental changes, evident quickly, fast, those aren't well, sustainable. I mean, neuroscoping is a great example here because, you know, the thing about peak performance, as I've always said, 
works like compound interest. So does narrow sculpting, right? Like these are both pro the, the, these processes. It's slowly, 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 slowly. And um, one, you know, in terms of older athletes, you got to sort of train yourself to be addicted to that much slower progress, yeah. right? That, that took a little while. But um, one of the things I like about there's just a lot more freedom and playfulness. The other thing, Lisa, that we discovered, and this was sort of one of the core of the, another core idea that was the heart of our, of what we, what we were doing was that um, there's this idea, Anders Ericsson, who was big inspiration to me. And, and, and really actually uh, I had conversations with Anders Ericsson about X performance led me sort of into what became my work on peak performance aging way back when, but uh, um he came up with deliberate practice, right? Do the same thing over and over again, slightly better, this 10,000 hours. But there's a line of research that's based more on kind of brain dynamics and embodied cognition, things like that. It says, and these words mean something specific, dynamic, deliberate play massively outperforms deliberate practice. So deliberate play is defined as repetition without repetition. So instead of doing, trying to do the same thing over again, you're trying to do the same thing and slightly improvise. And it just gives you exposure to more learning environments. And as a result, you end up learning faster. Dynamic simply means full body, right? Principles of body cognition say, hey, we're not heads on sticks. The brain is fully embodied. It's the brain and the body and the environment all working together to create cognition and um, built on those ideas. Um, it was though it was that it was one inch at a time and taking this dynamic, deliberate play based approach to learning Because here is the coolest thing. And there's more research needed, but you probably heard this. There's a motor learning window that opens in kids, right? It helps them learn languages. It helps them learn gymnastics and ballet. And there's this theory that like, if you haven't learned these skills by the time you're done to being a teenager, don't bother park skiings in that realm too, because it's so dynamic gymnastics. And it turns out that window doesn't actually close mm -hmm. in late childhood. What actually happens in late childhood is we stop learning by a dynamic, deliberate play-based approach. I was just going to ask that. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what happens. It's the yeah. approach. The brain is built to learn that way. And when you put it in that environment and let it learn that way, that window reopens. And you yeah, can start I, I was going to ask what you think we're doing to our future by removing play from the school curriculum and recess time and, and all of these things that stimulate the creativity and the and the, the play aspect of learning. What are we doing? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's funny also because I mean, the first thing I think when like one, I wonder what they're doing in the classroom. Forget about recess, forget, right? Like, I wonder why are you not playing in the classroom because, you know, for all the obvious, all, all the obvious reasons. And then, you know, every, I mean, you know, one of the crazy things about all that is if you really take embodied cognition seriously, and the data is overwhelming at this point, you know, for example, uh, language learning and math learning, very new research, but if you're trying to learn a foreign language and you couple a word with a gesture, your chances of learning that word go up massively. In fact, they see this in infants when this is one of the coolest, this is my, this is my, one of my favorite embodied cognition facts. So if an infant points at a thing and his mother says, oh, that's a broom within two months, that word broom will enter the infant's vocabulary. Amazing. The coupling of the infant's gesture, the mother's word is how the learning system is designed to work. Well, I can tell you from having a Sicilian mother that every hand gesture <laughs> goes with a curse and yeah. I, and they're just coupled. They are. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I, I have it, well, it's interesting. They, so on that tip, they now believe that gesture is our first language and that thoughts emerge in gesture. And I don't know if you've seen this research, but there's all this work on gesture poverty. So it turns mm -hmm. out that um, lower income communities and families tend parents tend to gesture less um across and so there's all these programs now that are going into lower income communities and teaching the parents 
to gesture more because they're finding that kids who are raised without gestures don't actually learn to think properly. Well, so, is the, I'm wondering if this is my my line of thought goes to, is it because gestures are generally processed? I'm going to I'm going to piss off neuroscientists here and make generalizations. Is it because gestures are generally processed by implication through the right hemisphere? And we have to couple that with a left hemisphere understanding of the word. And so we're getting more of a, a, a bilateral stimulation in the learning if a word is accompanied with a gesture. That's where my brain goes. So. I have well, I, one. I have no idea. Okay. The, let me just let me. I have I have no idea. Um, what I can tell you how I think about it and, and stuff like I, I, the brain. You probably know this, but the brain was designed for movement, right? Like movement is what the brain does predominantly, and <clears throat> the exact same processes that underpin how muscles move underpin how neurons communicate. Right? It's all it's all very much sort of the same thing. Um, and so you're using the system the way it was designed to be used is really what you're doing. And I've always maintained that, you know, peak performance is just getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. Peak performance aging is the exact same thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, what's changed is the old idea, the long, slow route theory, all this shit declines with age. The new realization is that's not wrong. Like all this stuff does decline with age, but everything that declines is a use it or lose it skill. Yeah. So as long as you keep using the skills, we can retain them and we can improve them very late in life. And the other finding that's really cool um, that is sort of based on what you were talking about. And this is interesting. So as we age, uh, Gene Cones, who, the, who I think of as, as one of the godfathers of peak performance aging, um, uh, made this discovery as we get it into our 50s provided we do it right we can talk more about what that means right there are foundational shifts in how the brain processes information and you end up with access if you do it right to whole new levels of intelligence whole new levels of creativity empathy and wisdom and wisdom is a, a is a, a it's a really definable skill but it is also for a bunch of other reasons neuroprotective against cognitive decline so one of the things about lifelong learning and the challenge skills balance, all these, these NAR style quests, what's one of the big deal is, is if you want to prevent cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's, all of it, you need expertise and wisdom. Both of those are mm. neural protect. They're, but expertise and wisdom basically are these giant networks formed throughout the brain. So even if like one part of the brain starts to rot away, right, that protects it. But one of the things that you that does happen as we get older is so hemispheric divisions in the brain have been an you know an ongoing topic argument, right? The original was left was logical, right was creative. That's not true. Then it was left was uh, big uh, left was uh, the trees and right was the forest. Big big picture versus small picture what it now appears to be um and all of those things sort of weave together into this is that the right is novelty we learn stuff on the right side of the brain and the left is where we pass it over and there's a shift over our lifetime from the right side of the brain to the left side of the brain processing shifts to the left side of the brain which is why expertise and wisdom which are these sort of networks of how things work one of the reasons they're neuroprotective against cognitive decline but the other thing that also happens is you get better hot hemispheric communication, even though this shift happens, right? The two sides of the brain talk to each other. So one of the reasons, right, the brain can survive, like when, you know, the, you know, a lot of really famous Alzheimer's studies where they autopsy the brains afterwards, they find them filled with Alzheimer's and tangles and plaques, but there were no symptoms of cognitive decline. The question was why, and it's always about expertise and wisdom and how, you know, that basically uses the dynamics of the brain in later life the disadvantage. I love really cool. that you give hope to all the people, you know, getting getting out of their 30s and then moving beyond that this stuff becomes even more accessible when you get into your 50s. I 
I definitely feel that I did not think I would be this healthy, this strong, this um, engaged in new learning, in new skills acquisition, learning new languages, but it all just sort of unlocked. I mean, of course, I unlocked it very intentionally, but it was there to unlock. Um, but one thing I, I kind of want to round out with this, because this is curious to me, you, di you seem to differentiate between flow state and learning, and you said flow amplifies learning as though they're different animals. Are they? I'm curious. So, yeah, you can learn without flow. You absolutely can learn without flow. In fact, uh, I mean, essentially a little bit of norepinephrine in the basal lateral amygdala is enough to prime the brain for, you know, for a learning process. And um, a lot has to ha like, that is also, by the way, that is also one of the first things that happens as we transition into flow. Um, but um, yeah, there's a lot of learning without flow, but uh, flow. So what is interesting about flow and adult development and, and one of the theories about the evolutionary purpose of flow is that is a signal of mastery. So the idea is that it's useful for an organism to know when it's actually learned something, especially if like, you know, do I want to go hunt this tiger or not? Kind of like that's the thing you're trying to learn, right? We're getting it wrong, getting it right. You get fed, getting it wrong. You're going to die kind of thing. Um, it would be helpful to go, oh, wow, I've got spear throwing mastery. And how do you know? Right. And so one of the ideas about flow is among its many attributes is it seems to be a signal of you've mastered this task. You, like you, if this is happening, you've got it. Feel free to you know, proceed like you have those skills. So that, is it a signal that you've habituated or automated it so that it's automated. energy efficient? It seems to be, well, it's not. But it's what's interesting is is and not yet clear. Hmm. So when you automate a single skill, will it produce flow is an open question. Mm -hmm. When you take a bunch of skills that you've automated and you put them together into one meta skill, so think about mm -hmm. uh, hitting a baseball, right? Mm -hmm. It's 11, 12, you're keeping your eye on the ball, you're stepping through, you're shifting your weight, you're following through with the bat, you do like 11, and most of them are learned independently. Flow is what happens when all those skills come together for the first time you know, with no conscious interference. And that's how the brain turns a bunch of independently chunked skills into one larger schema or action plan kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That appears to be true. Does it, now, can you learn individual skills? Might it be micro flow? There's still like, there's still questions. And Csikszentmihalyi actually made the argument, and I agree with him, that flow is the actual core mechanism for adult development it is how we it is the is how we grow here and it and it's through because because you have to push on your skills so on the other side of a flow state you are more complex you are more adaptable and um th this is the mechanism of development and other things that come with development like greater empathy greater perspective great right all those things also come with flow um so you might be more right than I'm giving you credit for, but I like it's not yet there in the research, but it's yeah. not. It's an interesting idea. Yeah. And so then this leads me to the question I know people are going to ask, well, how do I know when I'm in flow? Right. You, you're living it and you're investigating it and experiencing it and extrapolating it and studying it. But that's an easy one. I mean, that's an easy one. I mean, yeah. that's like that's work that dates back to the, to the 60s, or 70s. Flow has six core characteristics. And when they all show up at once, that's flow. Complete concentration on the task at hand, the merger of action and awareness, sense of self disappears, self consciousness. Sometimes it's like bodily awareness. Um, time distorts. Usually, it's so sucked into what you're doing that like five hours go by in five seconds. Right. Sometimes it'll slow down. Uh, you get a sense of control, like the feeling that you can control things you can't normally control. Because this is so on the outside, right? If you're in flow and I'm watching you, I, I'm probably looking at peak performance. I'm like, oh, wow, that's Lisa just kicking ass, right? But on the inside, it doesn't feel like peak performance. It feels like a sense of control. Wow, I can do things I can't normally do. Yeah. And then finally, the experience is autotelic, which means it's overwhelmingly joyous. It's euphoric. It's ecstatic. Yeah. So when all of those show up at once and they're 
tuned to like one or two on a scale of one to 10. We call that micro flow. So this is, you go to uh, work, you sit down to write an email to a colleague. It's like supposed to be a two minute quickie email, but you get so sucked into the email and the idea that, you know, an hour goes by, you've written an essay and maybe bodily awareness didn't, or I mean, self didn't totally vanish, but bodily awareness was gone. And when you pop back in, you're like, oh, wow, I got to pee. That happens right. to all of us all the time, right? Like right. that's really common. That's daily for a lot of people. Um, macro flow is the other end of the spectrum. And, you know, macro flow for the first 50 years, people were studying it. They thought it was a spiritual experience found only or a mystical experience found only in spiritual and religious communities because you can become one with everything and can have out of body experiences. And, you know, we understand the neurobiology of where all that stuff comes from and how it relates to flow now. But they, they didn't until, you know, uh, in the 1950s. So oh. this is this it leads me to a really interesting thought. I've had a lot of different moments of trauma in my life and the traumatic moments match a lot of the flow indicators except for one which is not joyous. But I would say that when I recollect traumatic moments in my in my life I have dilated time. I have oh, yeah. been completely aware. I have felt so at one with what was happening that I was in the matrix, but yet it was trauma and it wasn't joyous. So how how does flow show up in those moments? If you would even call that flow, I don't know, but it seems to me so, to feel similar. So I have a, myself, Drs. Michael Menino, Scott Kelso, and Richard Husky, have an enormous paper. I think it comes out next week, if not the week after, in Neurosense and Biobehavioral Reviews that asks this question. So this is it's based around a thought, a very simple thought experiment, but you're gonna you're gonna laugh really hard. But here's the thought experiment. You're driving down the freeway in a motorcycle and the car cuts you off and you swerve around the car. One of two things happens in the same swerve, you swerve around the car, it feels really great. Like it goes better than expected. You're like, oh, wow, I got this. And you come around the car and you drive off and flow or same exact swerve, but it scares you. Right. And you feel like you nearly died and you drive off in traumatic stress that could become PTSD. Right. That is really common. Yes, there are other things that could happen, but that binary, especially in action sports and things like that, that's common. So question, uh, and I, 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 I'm the leader author on the paper, and it, the question I originally started with four years ago was, the hell is the difference? Like, <laughs> I was like, this is just a window. It's like a second, right? Like there's a one second or two seconds. So the paper is called the first few seconds of flow. It literally looks at what happens in that like, two second say oh I, there's no not actual time but like what happens in that tiny little window that differentiates flow from trauma and interestingly one of the big things is a sense of control mm -hmm. so this is really in the most traumatic situ situations are this heavy intense thing is happening and i either I'm powerless against it or you basically I'm powerless against it. Right. And that leads towards what Martin Seligman learned, learned helplessness, right? Mm -hmm. Like exposure to be, I'm powerless against this. Eventually you get learned helplessness. Initially you get PTSD or trauma, right? Flow almost is the exact inverse. In fact, in the paper we say you could be, you could term it learn powerfulness. Mm. Um, and, uh, and so, and a lot of the transition really sort of starts there. There's other things going on. I could go into a lot like that. I could barrage you with really technical neuroscience. I, I have like 12 other conversations I want to have with you in the future. Cause this is what always happens. Every time I talk to him like, Ooh, wait, there's that. And then there's that. Um, okay. But I am sure that I have experienced that juncture where where I could feel the pull in either direction and I have landed in the side of trauma in a lot of those moments and I almost feel like it, if I could just go back to that dilated window what could have been different everything because I feel well, like that's what really, here's the actual what's interesting is this flow starts with the fight response trauma starts with the freeze response that's really 
the difference. And mm. um, so, okay, the, uh, there's a scene in our country where I'm skiing pencil shoot, which is the scariest thing I skied that entire season, and um, which is a very, it's a 75 foot, four foot wide shoot between two giant rock walls. And as I was skiing it, the icicles had fallen off the trees and blown in. So my right ski caught icicles and I started to tip forward. And if I would have fallen, I might have lived, maybe, maybe, but it probably definitely. Like there's that, that was a no fall you die scenario and I was falling. And what's really interesting is everything that perceived, like I time slowed down, it got deadly quiet, all the stuff that precedes both flow and trauma, you're totally right. And here was the diff. The difference was my brain went, I wreck because what that is, by the way, that that's endorphins, right? That's preparing you for, right? And I recognized it and I went, holy shit, I know this feeling. And as peaceful as it is right here, you're going to wake up in the hospital or you're not waking up. And I literally, like I fought, I it took this giant surge of adrenaline and testosterone, but that's literally the fight response. And to, in that moment, it was, I've done that before where I've managed to like pull out and overcome, but I've never experienced anything like that particular moment because it was so, the fall, I was falling forward and it took so much like force and will to like get myself out of that. Um, and, um, but it was really, you, you're, you are right on the front end, right? Um, it is very hard to differentiate one from the other. Um, yeah, I would say that I've had that experience. I've had two episodes in my life where I was blind by way of horrific accidents. The first one, I froze and stayed in a traumatic response and developed all sorts of eye neuroses off of that incident. The second one, the first one was when I was 11. The second one at 19, I was in such flow during the actual event as though I were in the matrix. And I remember immediately going into acceptance and problem solving. Oh, I'm blind. Now I have to figure out a whole bunch of shit. Like, how do I get myself to school? And like I, my brain went into problem solving and took an action oriented path of thought. I have zero trauma from the second accident, which was far worse than the first one. And I think that's why you just articulated it for me because trauma comes from freeze and flow is initiated by fight flee. And I feel like when the brain goes well, into no, flow, oh, yeah, well, fleeing also trauma comes from fleeing or freezing mm. um, flow, it, flow seems to come from fighting and it, it is not a hundred percent clear, but I am, you get a little bit of testosterone, uh, on top of a lot of the other chemicals that are duplicated, like norepinephrine shows up in flow, up in trauma, right? But testosterone may not show up on the freeze or flee, flee side, though it, mm. I'd be surprised if it doesn't when you flee. Um, but we're not quite uh, certain about the hormones. That's interesting. I never even correlated it to the hormones. Okay, so now I just, I'm <laughs> left with 10,000 times more questions than I started with. So um, this did My work here is done. Yeah, this didn't satiate me at all. This just made me hungrier. But um, which, and by the way, there is something for me so, uh, so seductively elegant around the idea of discipline and process and procedure that that's also, I just wanted to end with that, saying that's also what I really appreciate about NAR country is that I am experiencing the process and the discipline. And for me, I mean, I might as well be reading, you know, some seductive novel because that's what it is for me because discipline just, just does it for me. So I, I really, really am excited to finish it. I'm like three quarters of the way through. When can people get it? That's what we need to know. Uh, February 28th. So it's okay. still a little ways away. All right. Um, well, get on the pre-order list, people, because um, because if you're an aging person, which you all are, so that means you, everybody, um, you need the book because 
you can age differently. This could change the entire landscape of aging. It should change the whole landscape of aging um, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, I mean, one, so much more is possible than we ever thought was possible. The other thing, this is equally like the flip side is you can rock to your drop pretty much, but you got to start to train pretty damn early. So uh, I'll get, like I'll give you a, a random example. VO2 max starts declining really in our in our twenties, definitely in our thirties, um, and you know that's an aerob- upper threshold aerobic capacity. We now know that well trained octogenarian athletes can have the VO2 max of a healthy thirty five year old. Caveat: They've been training that way for thirty years. Mm. So they started in their 50s, right? These are not people who started in their 20s, but they started mm-hmm. in their 50s. There's dietary stuff that people are looking at now. That's like you. The, one of the cool things about people performance aging is the research shows that even if you start in your eight, 80s with most of this stuff, you're going to actually get results. Mm-hmm. It, like most of the upsides of the things you can do will benefit you even late in life. But if you really are serious about this stuff and you want to start in your 20s and 30s, that's where, you know, that's where the, we, we have no idea what the upper limit of what possible might be. Okay. So peak performance equals guaranteed results. So why wouldn't you just commit yourself to, to learning more about peak performance and flow and incorporating these practices? So can you list, I don't know, the two simplest things for people to do just right now to orient themselves in this peak performance direction? I know it's hard to take your entire funnel and distill it into two things, but. Um, so the f- easiest thing I can do. So I don't know what the second thing is. So we're going to hold on to that. Okay. But if you go to www.flowresearchcollective forward slash flow blocker. Okay. So flow states have triggers. Getting into flow requires using those triggers. But most people have a couple things that stand in their way between them and more flow. And. This was so common that we decided to build a diagnostic. There are six major things that stand between people and flow. We built a diagnostic. It's been used by taken by tens and tens of thousands of people. So it, it, it's pretty well validated at this point. And it's free. Anybody can take it. And um, the res- we don't just give you results like this is just standing in your way. We give you all the steps you need to remove it. So that's just because there isn't there isn't one place to start. You know what I mean? I, you know, and I, I don't want to say something self-serving like by the art of impossible, by in our country, because those are also where you should start um, mm-hmm. or at least go to like flowresearchcollective.com and watch all the videos. They're free. Um, but I always. So in the art of impossible, which was my old, older book, right? Um, one of the things that book is about is about the sort of the full suite of cognitive peak performance. And when people say cognitive peak performance, we actually know what that is. It's a bunch of things that live under the heading of motivation, a bunch of things under the heading of learning, a bunch of things under the heading of creativity, and a bunch of things under the heading of flow. That's actually the full suite. That's everything the brain does cognitively. So when we say peak performance, those are the four skill sets. Now, what's interesting about this is the brain evolved well, we evolved to bring these skill sets online in a kind of a specific order, um, which so if you were interested in peak performance, it always starts at the front end of motivation. Motivation gets you into the game. Learning allows you to continue to play. Creativity lets you steer and flow mm-hmm. lets you turbo boost the results. Right. That's the entire equation and motivation. And you, you mentioned this earlier, so I'm just going to go back to it. When you're trying to do this work, it always starts with curiosity. Curiosity is the most foundational, basic human motivator. You get a little bit of do- dopamine from curiosity. Uh, works as a flow trigger. Um, curiosity as well. Uh, also, you mentioned this earlier uh, as a tool. Mammalian, mammal, mammalian brains, humans are a little different, but most mammals can't feel curiosity and anxiety at the same time. It's either or. Humans can sort of do both, but it's really hard. Mm -hmm. So one of the easiest ways to fight anxiety 
is with curiosity, right? Really sort of great way. And you are, are know this and do this a lot, you know, in neurosculpting, you're always inviting people to be curious and like your language is very open and, you know, you, you, you go really far out of your way to hit those notes. Um, and I'm, I would guess also because that little bit of curiosity gives a little bit of dopamine going, which tightens focus, which makes the meditative process that you're playing with more effective. And so, also keeps us safe from having the person slip into anxiety states. Yeah. Yeah. That totally make that totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I like cultivating so much of peak performance, oddly, all starts with cultivating curiosity because you can't so flow can't happen if all of our attention isn't here in the present moment. Attention is actually coupled as a system to autonomy. We cannot pay attention all, we cannot fully pay attention to shit if we're not actually into it, if it's not, you know, our choice. Curiosity, thus, like the gate, like it's really the starting point for everything for a ton of different reasons. I've just sort of hinted at a few, but certainly, you know, to go back to where we started, if you're like a NAR style quest, basically, which is, you know, essentially like what did we do when we were training adults to, you know, uh, do this is we were teaching them to how to build dynamic, deliberate, play-based NAR style quests for them. Um, that's That seems to be one of the secret peak performance aging. And one of the reasons like on the dynamic side, right, is use it or lose it skills. For aging America, that means strength, stamina, flexibility, agility, and balance, right? Dynamic trains all five at once. That's the big deal with like the dynamic mm -hmm. stuff on that. But like that is a curiosity based effort, right? You're not gonna, you're not, you don't, you, you can't go into something that's hard and dangerous and challenging without curiosity. It starts there, I think. So I don't know. I would uh, say, a I would long, say, slightly longer answer, yeah. but. Amen to that. I think curiosity, uh, curiosity is our soup, one of our superpowers. And I'm glad that we're ending on that. Um, well, I am so, so excited that we got to have this conversation. Uh, as I said, I have like 12,000 more I want to have with you. But for now, I'm going to say thank you so much. And um, everyone, go get NAR Country. Either pre-order it now or get it if you're listening to this after it's come out. You don't have to be a skier. It's going to totally rock you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you, Lisa. It's great seeing you. Yeah. Thanks for listening to Unlock Hope. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we're at Neurosculpting Institute on Facebook, at Neurosculpting on Instagram. You can always reach out to us on our website, neurosculpting.com, and you can download our app, Neuropraxis. Stay well, everybody.